Jai Om Vishnu Pad Paramahansa Paravajikachari Sutta Sri Srimadhi Divine Grace Sri Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Iskan Bibidi Founder Charya Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Gruntarad Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai Go Pemanandi Hari Hari Bo Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo <clears throat> Reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, <coughs> Canto 3, text, sorry, yeah, Canto 3, Chapter 3, Text 14. Kiyan Buvo. Yam Shapituro Baro Yad Drona Bijmarjuna Bima Mulai Ast Astada So Astada So Shoghiniko Try that one again. Astada Saxo Hiniko Mud Amsar Aste Balam Dorvi Saham Yadunam <coughs> Kian Buvo Yam Shapito Robaro Kian buvo yam shapito robado <laughs> Yadrona bishmarjuna bima mulai Yadrona bishmarjuna bima mulai Astadasa shokiniko maramsar Astada so so hiniko madam sar Aste balam dor visaham yarunam Kian buvo yam shapito robado Yadrona bish marjuna bima mulai Astada Saxo Hiniko, Madame Sire Aste Balam Dor Visaham Yarunam
Vaishnavis. Kian, what is this? Bhuvaha, of the earth. I am this. Shapita, abated. Uru, very great. Baraha, burden. Yat, which. Drona, drona. Bhishma, bhishma. Arjuna, Arjuna, Bhima, Bhima, Mulai, with the help, Astadasa, 18, Akshohinika, phalanxes of military strength, and says in parentheses, Vidi Bhagavatam 116.34. Mat Amshai, my descendants, Aste, are still there. Balam, great strength. Dorvi Saham, unbearable. Yadunam, of the Yadu dynasty. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. This is um, Uddhava speaking. Uddhava speaking. Uddhava speaking to Vidura. Yeah. After the end of the battle of Kukshetra, the Lord said, well, this is now Krishna speaking, the abatement of the earth's great burden, 18 Akshohinis, has now been affected by the help of Drona, Bhishma, Arjuna, and Bhima. But what is this? But what is this? this? There is still the great strength of the Yadu dynasty, born of myself, which may be a more unbearable burden. Okay, so purport. It is a wrong theory that due to an increase in population, the world becomes overburdened, and therefore there are wars and an uh, and other annihilating processes. The earth is never overburdened. The heaviest mountains and oceans on the face of the earth hold more living entities than there are human beings, and they are not overburdened. If a census were taken of all the living beings on the surface of the earth, certainly it would it would be found that the number of human beings is not even 5% of the total number of living beings. If the birth rate of human beings is increasing, then the birth rate of other living beings is increasing proportionately. The birth rate of lower animals, beasts, aquatics, birds, etc., is far greater than that of human beings, period, 
There is an adequate arrangement for food for all living beings all over the earth by the order of the Supreme Lord. And he can arrange more and more if there is actually disproportionate increase of living beings. Okay, that's that point. Therefore, there is no question of an increase in population causing a burden. The earth became overburdened due to Dharma Glani or irregular discharge of the Lord's desire. The Lord appeared on the earth to curb the increase in miscreants and not, to in, and not the increase in population. Wait, wait, wait. The Lord appeared on the earth to curb the increase in miscreants and not the increase in population. Okay. As is wrongly put forward by the mundane economist. When Lord Krishna appeared, there, there had been a sufficient increase in miscreants who had violated the desire of the Lord. The material creation is meant for fulfilling the desire of the Lord. And his desire is that the conditioned souls who are unfit to enter into the kingdom of God have a chance to improve their conditions for entering. The entire process of cosmic arrangement is intended just to give a chance to the conditioned souls to enter the kingdom of God. And there is an adequate arrangement for their maintenance by the nature of the Lord. Therefore, although there may be a great increase in population on the surface of the earth, if people are exactly in line with God consciousness and are not miscreants, such a burden on the earth is a source of pleasure for her. There are two kinds of burdens. There is the burden of the beast and the burden of love. The burden of the beast is unbearable, but the burden of love is a source of pleasure. Srila Vishwanath Chakravati describes the burden of love very practically. He says that the burden of the husband on the young wife and the burden of the child on the lap of the mother and the burden of wealth on the businessman, although actually burdens from the viewpoint of heaviness, are sources of pleasure. And in the absence of such burdensome objects, one may feel the burden of separation, which is heavier to bear than the actual burden of love. When Lord Krishna referred to the burden of the Yadu dynasty on the earth, he referred to something different than the burden of the beast. The large numbers of the family members of, born of Lord Krishna counted to some millions and were certainly a great increase in the population of the earth. But because all of them were expansions of the Lord himself by his transcendental plenary expansions, they were a source of great pleasure for the earth. When the Lord referred to them in connection with the burden on the earth, he had in mind their imminent disappearance from the earth. All the members of the family of the Lord were incarnations of different demigods, and they were to disappear from the surface of the earth along with the Lord. When he referred to the unbearable heaviness on the earth in connection with the Yadu dynasty, he was referring to the burden of their separation. Srila Jiva Goswami confirms this inference. Omegana Tamaranda Shajananjana Shalakaya Chakshu Namilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dirati Swapadanti Kam. So this is a very interesting uh, translation and purport. And it's uh, a number of really important points emerge upon reading this and thinking about it. Uh, just to start off with, though, I'll just a bit of background information. An Akshohini is approximately uh, 200,000 fighting units. It's, I think it's like 21,000 chariots, 21,000 horses, so many infantry soldiers like that. So an Akshohini is about uh, according to other places in Prabhupada's books, about 200,000. So if you multiply that by 18, that's about three and a half million 
So that's a lot less than other figures we hear about how many uh, people were killed on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. But anyway, that's the figure that's given here. It's a lot. So 18 Akshahinis were uh, annihilated uh, during the battle of Kurukshetra. Now, here's the interesting thing. Prabhupada says here, in the ch uh, well, Krishna's speaking now. Uddhavas starts us off and he says, the Lord said. So this is, we're hearing Krishna speak here. So Krishna says, towards the end of his statement, he says, after referring to how, with the help of Drona, Bhishma, Arjuna, and Bhima, these 18 Akshohinis, the, the earth was relieved of the great burden of the 18 Akshohinis of military strength. But then Krishna goes, but what is this? Like, you know, but what, anyway, what is, that's nothing. As, as, as if to say, that's nothing. He goes on to say, there is still the great strength of the Yadu dynasty, born of myself which may be a more unbearable burden. So now at face value, it certainly sounds to me like Krishna is talking about the same thing as he, as he is in the first part of the, his statement, which is that, that you know, that the, the Yadus are going to be a burden because of their military strength. And that's always the impression I've, I've had for years. I mean, I've read this before, but I just kind of forgot about it. And I've always been thinking that, yeah, just in the same way that all these, you know, Akshohinis of soldiers that were present on the battlefield of Kurukshetra and that were, uh, you know, commanded by Jarasandha or this one or that one, Kalyama, in the same way that they're a burden on the earth because they're, you know, unnecessary build, uh, build up. And f actually, for the reasons Prabhupada mentions later in this purport, in the same way, the Yadus are going to be a burden like that, right? It sounds like that from the translation, right? From, and this is Krishna speaking. Does anybody get any other impression just from the, tra the translation? Okay, right. You, you wouldn't because, I mean, it doesn't say, what it doesn't say is that, this is Krishna speaking, he says, there is still the great strength of the Yadu dynasty, born of myself. Ah. Uh which, let me get my train of thought here. There is still the great strength of the Yadu dynasty, born of myself, who, if not, he doesn't, there's nothing to indicate here. Oh, yeah, there's nothing to indicate in Krishna's statement the interpretation that we receive in the purport. See, because in the purport, it's clearly saying here that Prabhupada says, referring to Jiva Goswami, he says, when... Lord Krishna referred to the burden of the Yadu dynasty on the earth. He referred to something different from the burden of the beast. The large numbers of the family members of born of Lord Krishna counted to some millions was certainly a great increase in the population of the earth. See, it's, it's not, there's no indication in the translation that that's the burden that's being referred to. But Prabhupada's making that point in the purport and he, and he quotes from, or he cites Jiva Goswami to, uh, support that point. So anyway, so the important, the reason I'm bringing this up and making a big deal out of it is because from this we can understand that how much we need the uh, commentary of the Acharyas because how would you pick up on that? J just from the statement of the translation alone, there's no way that you'd be able to understand that, oh, that's the burden that's being referred to. But f from the purport, we can understand that that's the, that's the esoteric understanding. So we have to uh, heavily rely on the uh, commentaries of the acharyas to get the, what to speak of esoteric, get the proper understanding of statements, which might seem obvious, but anyway, here's an example of that. Correct? Yeah, correct. Well, it's a lot of people, but, and, and, and well, we're going to get to that because in the next part of the purport, Papa talks about that. And, um, okay, so that's that point. We'll just put that one in the parking lot for the moment. And uh, now, in the purport, Papa 
right off the bat starts talking, so it's a wrong theory that due to an increase in population, the world becomes overburdened and therefore there are wars. And, uh, so where is, what's the connection? What's the connection between the translation where it's talking about uh, how the earth is burdened by the, these unnecessary defense forces of these belligerent kings? What's the connection between that and the wrong theory that it, due to an increase in population, the world becomes overburdened? Okay, well, now I'm going it, to, that's a tricky question. Yeah, okay. What's the, what's the connection? Well, no, but he's talking about overpopulation all of a sudden. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll give you what I, my take on it, okay? Okay, quickie. Thank you, sorry. Uh, no, no, it's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. You, you, you make, no, 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 it's okay. Please. You just make your comment because I want to get moving. No, the, 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 the understanding that I have from the so-called scientists is that <clears throat> the more people you have, the more people you have to feed. And if you have to feed more and more, there's only so much, so they think, uh, food on the trees and on the ground. This is, of course, a mistake, and Prabhupada is correcting this right here. The whole idea is that you run out of food. But Prabhupada says you never run out of food because Krishna is in charge of the food supply. Right. Okay. Yeah, good point. So the connection is burden. See, the translation is talking about one type of burden, but Papa is using that as a springboard to talk about another type of burden. Now, I'll give you a little kind of anecdote to kind of explain what's going on here, my understanding. In the eighth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a section where it talks about there's a war between the demigods and the demons. And it's, uh, in one purport, it describes that the fighting was very, very fierce, and it said the blood, I think it was referring to the blood of, the, of the, the people that were killed, it went up to the uh, sun planet, but it didn't reach the moon planet. Something to that effect. Maybe it was the weapons or the blood or something. It reached the moon, it reached the sun planet, but it didn't reach the moon planet. Okay. Now in the purport, Prabhupada said, so this is evidence. He said, this is further evidence from the Bhagavatam that the sun is further away than the moon. So Prabhupada made that statement in the purport in the eighth canto. Those of you have, huh? Yeah, sorry, that the moon is further away than the sun. It reached the sun, but it didn't reach the moon. So, and those of us who have been around, remember that. So Hari Sari, uh, Hari Sari was Prabhupada's personal servant. So on one occasion, Hari Sari brought that to Prabhupada's attention. And he said, Prabhupada, I'm a little bit, you know, bewildered by this, of what you said here in this purpose. I said, why? He said, well, because you're, you know, you're using this, you're presenting this as evidence that the moon is further away than the sun, but this battle wasn't fought on the earth planet. It was fought, it was between the demigods, you know, the, the Devas and the Asuras, so it, it, you can't, can't be used, you know, to uh, prove that point. And Papa looked at it, he read, he said, oh yeah, you're right, you're right. You know, he over, had overlooked that. He said, so in the next edition, have him change it. And then Prabhupada went on to say, he said, I'll take, any, I'll, I'll take any damn opportunity to smash those scientists. So that was Prabhupada's, is that accurate? Did I tell that accurate? You read that? Yeah, so that was Prabhupada's mood. He, he was very much, it's, you know, when somebody presented a false theory, like a scientist or, uh, it just so happens that this man, Amal Bhaktamaraj, got it, remembers from his high school or college days, he got it right. He, Prabhupada's referring here to the uh, theory of, what was his name? Thomas Malthus. Thomas Malthus. Uh, and guess what, guess, guess what that theory was called, by the way? The Malthusian theory. <laughs> Fine. Malthusian theory. Thomas Malthus. He named it after himself, or somebody named it after him. And it was just that, that, you know, there's the, the, the population of the earth increases, the human population on earth will increase geometrically, whereas the the increase in food only increases arithmetically. So therefore, periodically, there has to be wars, famines, this some natural type of disaster to bring things back into equilibrium. That was his theory, okay? So 
he was about the same time as Darwin, you know, late teens, 1700s, early 1800s. So, and Prabhupada in school learned about all these things. You know, he, he, was, cause he was taught about that, Malthusian theory and Darwin's theory of evolution. So Prabhupada liked to take opportunities to kind of show, point, you know, point out that no, these are incorrect ideas, which is what he's doing in the purport. Putting one of those theories before Prabhupada is like putting a red flag in front of a bull. You know, it's kind of like, it's an it's a, it's, it's, it's a invitation for an argument. So Prabhupada's arguing here. And as Amal Bhaktivinoda pointed out, uh, you know, no, it's not the case. It's not the case that, first of all, where does he get this idea? Where, where does he come up with the theory that, that because there's uh, more population, that there's some law, he's... Re, he's Referring to some, there's some law of nature that automatically, when is it too, uh, too much population, then there's some law of nature that regulates things, you know, creates some, some war or some famine or some this or some that. Where does he get that from? What, what, you know, is, is that, is it some, you know, some, do laws of nature just get, you know, come right out of the clear blue sky or something? Um, if he's an atheist, that's you know it's one way to explain things. And even if he's a theist, uh, it's still it's called, what's referred to as mental speculation. You know, formerly the scientists used to be called natural theologians. That was before it was called science. It was called natural theology. And those fellows they believed in God. And they what, what they did was they tried to explain the way God was working. You see. Now, this, I don't know if Malthus was an atheist or a theist, okay, but if, let's, 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 we'll uh, analyze both cases. If he was an, um, an atheist, well, my, my response to him would be, how do you know that's how, you know, where, where do you think these laws of nature, where do they come from in the first place? You think, are they born out of the clear blue sky, as I said? And if he's a theist, if he's trying to say that God works this way, my response to that would be, how do you know? How do you know how God works? There's one statement in the Bhagavad Gita, one, in one purport in the Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada says that um, mental speculation that leads one away from the conclusion of God or that Krishna is God is a serious sin. So here's an example of that. In Malthus, Darwin, these guys, you know, they're intelligent, but they're speculating. They're, they're presenting their mental speculation and as the, the, the conclusion of, the, of this mental speculation is not that people believe in God, what the speaker believe in Krishna, is that people become atheistic. People, these, these ideas tend to support that conclusion, that there is no God. And that's why it's referred to, and the Prabhupada says in the Bhagavad Gita, mental speculation that leads one away from the understanding of Krishna or God is a serious sin. Okay? In the back of the Isa Upanishad, um, there's a very well-written I don't even know what you call these, you know, like a little thing about the blurb about the book. I'm just going to read one, a couple sentences um, that relate to this. It says the Sanskrit word Sri Isopanishad means knowledge that brings one nearer to the supreme person, Krishna. So Prabhupada was, is a representative of the Sri Isopanishad, you know, the external manifestation of the super soul or the Vedic literatures like that. So as an external a manifestation of the Sri Sopanishad, that was Prabhupada's thing, to bring people nearer to Krishna or God. So it goes on to say, Isopanishad directly counters the teachings of modern science. So we could see that Prabhupada was a personification of that. He was the personification of that, exactly that, countering the teachings, the false teachings of modern science. And then it goes on to say, which exactly one of the main false ideas, misconceptions, is that at the root of existence lies not a person, but merely abstract laws governing the chance collision of subatomic particles. So how do they know that? How do they know that at the root of existence lies not a person, but abstract laws? They're just speculating. That's their speculation. They don't know that. They don't have proof that at the root of existence lies abstract laws governing the chance collision of subatomic particles. Where did the subatomic particles come from that are colliding? Where does the law come from? As I said, laws don't just come out of the clear blue sky. They're speculating, you see, and Prabhupada's calling them out. That's what Prabhupada's doing here. He's calling them out, right, in this, power, in this purport here to start off with. 
So that's what we're hearing here. And as Amal Bhaktamaraj nicely pointed out, uh, Krishna knows what he's doing. Krishna knows, Krishna, first of all, Krishna invented this whole thing. It's Krishna's ideas to start off with, the whole creation. And then he, he's the inventor. He's, the, he's the, like the manufacturer. He set the whole thing up. He knows how to manage. Krishna knows how to manage his creation. And, and Prabhupada's, and he gives you the, the, the clear example that, you know, the, in the mountains and in the oceans, there's way more living entities than there are human beings on earth. And they're not starving, you know. They're, they're being nicely taken care of. They've got plenty of food. All the, the creatures in the Himalaya mountains and the d depths of the oceans and the, the rivers, and they got their food, you know. Krishna knows how to look after his creation. And what's going on in the human society, it's not because Krishna doesn't know how to manage. Uh, you know, there's another reason. And that reason is, and, and the actual, and the, the burden that's being referred to in this verse, and the reason is because people are dharma glani. They're irregular in the discharge of the Lord's desire. They're becoming, you know, they're atheistic. They're not behaving the way they're supposed to be behaving. And uh, nature, which is uh, an agent of Krishna, is responding by making things difficult, you know, by restricting resources and by, you know, doing things so that they maybe kind of get the message. I'll give you an example. Anyway, Prabhupada says here that the, in the purport, the Lord appeared on the earth to curb the increase in miscreants, not the increase in population, as is wrongly put forward by the mundane economist. And it points out here that the material creation is meant for fulfilling the desire of the Lord. And here it is. His desire is that the conditioned souls who are unfit to enter the kingdom of God at this point have a chance to improve their conditions for entering. Okay, so here's an, an analogy that kind of I thought up to try to illustrate this point, okay, of what's, you know, of Krishna, the relationship between Krishna and, and, the, and the creation, okay? Uh, and and, and, and um, bearing in mind what we just heard, that the creation is an opportunity for these a chance for the conditioned souls to improve themselves so that they can enter into the kingdom of God. Okay, so imagine this hypothetical situation that it's your spiritual master's uh, Vyas Puja, all right? And you're living in a community where there's a lot, a lot of God brothers and God sisters, and most of them are not following properly, for, you know, unfortunately at, at this point. They've fallen away, some partially, some completely, they're just like out there in Maya, okay? But your desire is, okay, no, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this really nice Vyasa Puja and, and invite everybody, and we're going to try to really kind of help them, inspire them, and try to help them get back into Krishna consciousness again, back into serving Guru Maharaj, okay? So you make a really nice arrangement. You, you know, you, you make all the thing, you know, get permissions from the temple president. You can, you have the temple room decorated really nicely with garlands and incense, you know, and, and then you have a whole beautiful feast arranged in the prasadam room for afterwards. And same thing, it's all like, you know, there's pictures of your spiritual master there and, 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 and music playing and, the, you know, in the background, him doing a kirtan or a bhajan or something. You know, you've created a really beautiful devotional atmosphere, okay? And everybody's invited. And then some of the and, and, and devotees are coming, and some of them are appreciating it. Some of them are really like, wow, this is so nice. Yeah, wow. But others are coming, and they're just kind of like, they're coming in their karmi clothes. You know, they're coming like just not dressed appropriately. And they're, and they're having their phone in their hand, and they're playing some karmi music. And they're coming in with like a, you know, a, a, a pizza or something like, you know, a, even worse, a hamburger that they bought out at McDonald's. And just, and they just kind of, what? You know, where's, he, where they, where's their head at? And they're kind of bringing down the whole thing. They're bringing down, you follow what I'm saying? They're bringing down the whole atmosphere. And it's like a bummer. You know, you, you went to all this trouble to arrange this beautiful devotional atmosphere to inspire everybody back into their Krishna consciousness. And, you know, some of the people are just not, because they're not behaving properly, they're, they're, they're missing it themselves. They're missing out totally on the opportunity themselves and they're messing it up for other people because they're bringing down the whole thing. They're bringing down the atmosphere. Does that make sense? Is that a good example? That's what's going on here. That's what's going on here. That's what's going on here on the earth. Krishna's made a whole beautiful arrangement. You know, this earth is actually beautiful. 
If you stop and think about it, he's made a whole beautiful arrangement for what purpose? For the purpose of trying to give the conditioned souls a chance to improve in their God consciousness so they could eventually completely get it together and go back to Godhead. That's the purpose of this material world, you know? And there's people who are, who are appreciating it. You know, there are people who are appreciating it, but then there's people who just, they've lost it. They're just, it's just, yeah, they're depreciating it. It's just gone right over their head. They've missed it. They've missed the, they've missed the boat, you know, they're just, and, they're, and they're messing it up for other people too. And that's the Dharma Siglani, you see? That's, and that, that's what has to be dealt with. That's, that's what has to be addressed. So, so that's what Krishna you know, has to deal with that. And just like if, you know, if that, going back to the hypothetical situation, what do you do? What do you do? You know, when you, you've made all these arrangements and you can see these people, former, you know, God brothers and God sisters, and they're just not getting it. You, you don't, you got to do something. So Krishna is doing different things. It's hard to say just one thing. Krishna is doing all sorts of different things within human society to try to correct things, you see? And uh, it happens in many, many different ways. But um, I'll just throw in here a little bit of, it's not a new thing. I remember, um, I'm, I'm from a kid growing up. I'm from a, actually a Jewish background. I'll just throw this in there. And uh, Eastern European. So they speak a language called Yiddish. And I, my mother didn't really speak it, but she knew her mother did. And she always, she remembered certain like little phrases. So. I got a few of them. One, the only one I remember was, uh, what, only one of the only ones I remember was um, the the Shana, no, yeah, the Shana, the, the Shana Velta, the uh, dimension Meshugana, which means the world is beautiful, the people are crazy. <laughs> Same idea, you know. They understood that Krishna, God, has created a beautiful world, for, you know, to give us an opportunity to live and you know, become, uh, improve in our spiritual lives. But anyway, people are crazy and they're, they're not, they're missing it. And a lot of, not everybody, but a lot. And they're messing it up for other people too. So that's what's going on. So that's the burden. And then it, uh, it goes on to speak about, oh, and then Prabhupada in the last paragraph here talks about how, you know, there's two types of burdens. There's two types of burdens. There's the burden of the beast and then there's the burden of love. And, and he talks about, gives, and he gives very nice examples, well, uh, Vishwanath Chakravati gives very nice examples of the burden of love. So getting back to that example I gave, so imagine this though, we're going to change the uh, scenario a little bit at that, at our imaginary Vyas Puja. Imagine that, okay, you made all these arrangements for your, you know, to, to really inspire the devotees and uh, not only all your God, God brothers and God sisters came, but like they invited people because she was an open invitation. So they invited other uh, disciples of other gurus. And, and rather than you expecting like 100 or 200 people and like 1,000 or 2,000 people showed up all of a sudden on the day, you know? Um, so that's, that's a burden, right? That's a burden. But would you be unhappy if that happened? Charlie, you know, put yourself, you're, 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 the, you're, the, you're the arranger, right? You, would, you figured on, okay, there's going to be 100, maybe 200 that are going to show up. And all of a sudden on the day, 1,000 or 2,000 show up. How would you feel? Would you feel, huh? You'd feel good. But it's, it's a burden, right? Well, yeah, that's, it's a burden of love. It's, that's the burden of love. I mean, obviously, all of a sudden, you're going to have to shift into high gear and, you know, grab rot in the bouchon and say, hey, we need another thousand samosas or whatever, you know. You're going to have to shift into high gear to really accommodate, make, you know, to, to deal with that, but you're not going to mind. You're going to feel like, okay, that's good. I don't mind. You see, because that's the burden of love. So that's what, you know, Prabhupada's talking about here in this last. So Krishna's like that too, you know. If, if, if all of a sudden, if, if people were behaving properly, Krishna wouldn't, Krishna's not upset that he, you know, we, Krishna wouldn't mind the extra work and providing more food and more space for everybody and whatever else he has to provide, uh, no problem. No problem for Krishna. You know, th this, this earth planet is like it's a piece of cake for Krishna to produce an earth planet. He could do it with his eyes closed. As a matter of fact, he does do it with his eyes closed. 
right? Mahavishnu, he's lying on the cause lotion there and the universe is coming. So this, it's nothing for Krishna to supply more resources but, and he'd be, he's, he'd be happy to do it, inspired to do it if people were, you know, had the right understanding. That's the burden of love, see? And we can understand through that example. So, um, yeah, so basically, I guess that's all I wanted to say. So does anybody have anything they'd like to, uh, first questions and then comments, if that's okay. Any question? Uh, f question first? Question. So very deep cl uh, class you gave. So according to your class, uh, you know, <clears throat> not so many people, like in the beginning, a lot of people are coming, it was new, you know, in ISKCON, uh, everything was new. And uh, not so many people are coming today, you know, in you know, all the world, you can say, you know, ISKCON temples. Not so many. So, according to what you said, and it's just clear, is uh, is needed. Is my question is more purity all our members, including me for sure. <laughs> purity is the force. So, is it that reason Krishna didn't send people because we are not ready, you know, enough pure uh, to uh, keep them? And is it I like don't that? Know. <laughs> With all due respect, I think you missed the... Uh, you missed okay, the, my question is, uh, not so many conditioned souls are coming here. Uh -huh. I mean, many, you can say, you know, we distribute a lot of books. So my question is, according to what you said in your class, and according with... Uh, Okay, I don't, then, I, understand I, understand point. I don't think that's what I said in my class with all due respect, but mm. it's okay, no problem. I'll answer your question. Um, Prabhupada was, uh, once Triparari, in 1975 in Atlanta, Prabhupada met with the book distributors, the airport book distributors, and, and Triparari was kind of like the leader of the spokesman. So he said, um, uh, he said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, you know, sometimes we, we feel that if we were more pure, we could get people, everybody would take the books. And it's because we're not pure enough, that's why everybody's not taking the books. The same sort of an idea. So Prabhupada said, no. He said, that is your devotional sentiment. He said, that's nice. But he didn't, you know, he didn't say that. Prabhupada didn't agree. He said, yeah, if you all become more pure than more. He didn't agree. He said, that is your devotional sentiment. So it's not necessarily our fault that, you know, because we're not pure enough and, we, and Krishna sees that if he sent people that we wouldn't be able to, you know, take care of them properly. And that's why the Krishna conscious movement is small. I don't think so. I never heard Prabhupada say that. I never heard, I, if anything, I heard him say something that didn't support that in that conversation where Triparari asked that question. So I, I, I won't, couldn't go with that theory that it's because we're not pure enough that the Krishna conscious movement is not bigger and more successful. Krishna's got his plans and I don't know exactly I don't know. I don't have any idea how he's operating, what his idea is, but I don't think it's because we're not pure enough that the Krishna conscious movement is not bigger and better than what it is. So what's the reason why they're not why Krishna didn't send them here? What other reason? Ask Krishna. He's right there. You could ask him. Any other question? Yeah, question question and then a Okay, we'll take both. But go ahead. Be um, because you're quoting from Sri Shopanishad, and um, I wanted to tell a Sankirtan story. Okay. Okay, it's sure. from 19, nice it took place around 1982, and we were right outside the St. Louis airport. All the, all the book distributors were waiting to get picked up. Mergendra, my, I was Brahmachrini, he was still Brahmachari. Anyway, he came up in the car and um, was picking us up. Right in front of our car, there was a, a limousine with a, a, a diplomat was getting into it. So Magendra leaned over and he said, hey, give him this book. And it was a hardbound turquoise Sri Shopanishad. And I said, what should I tell him? And he said, tell him it's for world peace. It's the form that in this book is the formula for world peace. So I ran up 
and um, gave him the book. He had just gotten in the car, and I passed the book into him. And I said, this is a gift for you. It, in this book is the formula for world peace. It turned out that he was um, uh, Professor Brzezinski, Brzezinski, and he was the national security advisor for President Jimmy Carter. So about 15 years later, we were watching um, like this special thing, and Brzezinski was being interviewed, and he was basically, we were just both shocked. He was basically speaking Sri Shopanishad. And he was saying how all there is, there are plenty of resources and uh, economic. There's food for everyone in the world. We just have to develop how to, you Manage. know, de develop the, the share the resources. <laughs> how to do it? Yeah. So Prabhupada's books are, are yeah. potent. Okay. And that I'm was his his life work was to bring all bring everyone together, bring the world together. China, China, Russia. Israel, Egypt. Uh -huh. Nice, thank you. Maharaj? Well, it was a Sankatan story. She was, she was relating how, uh, you know, because I... What's the question? It, it was not a question. It was not a question. I asked for a question, but it was not a question, but it was, it was a, a nice, nice comment and story. Jai Hare Krishna. Uh, I'll try to be as fast as possible. We talk, and you were talking in reading, the burden of love. So one may ask, well, what's the burden? Love is not a burden, it's a pleasure. But it becomes a burden when the two parties who love one another so... No, no, I, I agree with what you, just, what you just said, but I also agree with what I said. And I think that the three examples by Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur also support um, the point I was making that, you know, like if all of a sudden a thousand or two thousand people showed up on the, for that hypothetical Vyas Puja, it would be a burden, but it's, a, it's part of the burden of love, just like the burden of the, the, the weight of the child on the mother's lap or the weight of the, you know, the, the husband on the wife or the... Uh, etc. Oh, the, the burden of managing a lot of money. It's, it's a burden. That's also a burden of love. It's not referring to separation here, but I also think your point was a correct point. Huh? I know. You're, you're, you're giving another... Right. So I said, I'm agreeing with your point, but I'm also agreeing with what I said. What I said was correct. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> 